Hi everyone, sorry, apologies for, for the delay there. Um, welcome um, to the first lunchtime talk, um, part of the AA Summer School, although it might be breakfast or dinner for some of you already. Um, I'm Federico Ortiz, uh, and together with Ushma Takrar, we run Unit 5 on Broadcastable Houses at the um, Summer School this year. And uh, we're delighted to have Nicolas Corodi with us today. Uh, just a few things um, before we start um, in terms of um, housekeeping. So uh, we'll record the session so everyone can watch it later on demand. And um, if you have any questions, we'll take questions after the presentation. So just raise your hands or you can um, put your questions in the chat if you, if you prefer that. And um, yeah, so um, Nicholas is a writer, designer and researcher from LA, um, currently based in Milan. And he's the co-founder of Adjustments Agency, he also works independently as Interiors Agency. And he published last year, The Uses of Decorating, um, a collection of four essays on the political economy of amateur home decorating. Um, and formerly he was the editor-in-chief of the Architecture Magazine ED. So we're really excited to have um, him with us today. Um, the, the, the book and his work really resonates with us in what we're discussing in, in the unit, so everything around uh, the kind of collapse of productive and reproductive labor in domestic spaces, um, especially after the, or throughout the pandemic, um, uh, but also, um, the work around refusal that um, probably we'll talk um, about it today as well. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nicholas Corodi. Thank you for having me. Um, is my screen, am I sharing my keynote or the whole screen? Just keynote? Yes, you're in keynote. Great, great. Um, you probably have to go in presentation mode, but yeah. I think I'm going to have to switch back and forth because I have a... Yeah. I've never really mastered Zoom, but anyway, thank you guys for having me. Um, much of my work over the past few years has explored changes in the political economy of domestic space, both past and present. In particular, I've explored the perhaps surprising durability of what today I'm describing as fictions about the home. In other words, normative representations or conceptions about what the home means and how it should function. Perhaps the most enduring of these is the definitional perception of the home as a space distinct from the factory or the office um, or other architectural spaces designed specifically for labor. Over the past year, of course, the home has been placed under seemingly unprecedented pressure as stay-at-home mandates have confined a large chunk of society within domestic space. More precisely, a new division in the working classes has been erected between those the state deems essential, but paradoxically exposes to epidemiological risk and those uh, whose labor can be performed within the home. COVID regulations accelerated an already present dynamic in which predominantly white collar professionals and members of the so-called creative class were allowed to work from home and which was often perceived as a sort of privilege but as we begin to exit from social distancing protocols, this supposed perk feels a lot less perky. COVID, uh, a new debate has emerged in corporate culture between those who demand a return to the office and those who would like to maintain the cost benefits of eliminating office rental fees. Employees seem to be as split on the matter as their bosses. Some have found working from home stifling and oppressive while others dread the return of their old commutes. Among the former, a common complaint has been that without the spatial distinction between home and workplace, life becomes a sort of doldrum of endless work, where once enjoyable activities like cooking dinner blur together with emails, spreadsheets, and Zoom meetings. Put differently, the widening of work from home has inadvertently exposed the social importance of the semantics of the home. It is less that we miss offices than that we miss the sanctity of the home as a privileged space removed from work life. You add the peephole of uh, people like exposure of constant video calls and suddenly the house or apartment doesn't feel like much of a shelter at all. In other words, work from home isn't a description of a location, but a mechanism that transforms the meaning and experience of a particular genre of space. 
Today, I'd like to try and unpack the conjunctive in this somewhat tyrannical neologism, the from that seems to simultaneously bridge and cleave work and home. That is, in order to function, work from home presupposes a pre-existing distinction between one form of activity, labor, and one form of architectural space, uh, which is domestic. This distinction is normative, uh, meaning it's, it's common sense itself, but I'd like to argue that it's a fiction and one that proves at times useful and at other times destabilizing. To do this, I'll be drawing on case studies from the book that Federico mentioned, the use of decorating, which was translated into Spanish and published last fall in Madrid, as well as essays I've published over the years in, in various uh, architectural journals predominantly. To try to understand the context of all of this, it's useful to look back a bit. The home is often perceived as a sort of space outside of time, politics, and economy, something that has endured and will continue to endure. But not long ago, labor co cohabitated with leisure, pleasure, consumption, and copulation. The home of a medieval peasant, for example, was also their workplace. The cleavage of work and home is in fact quite recent and also quite uneven. Throughout the modern era, members of the working classes often perform all sorts of work in their homes, alongside and in addition to work performed in factories or fields. Speaking more generally though, we can define a loose starting point for this fiction in the early modern era with the emergence of systems of wage labor. This was facilitated by a series of political, legal, and spatial operations known as enclosure, meaning essentially the privatization of land that was previously held in common by peasants and provided vital sources of sustenance. In the first volume of Capital, Karl Marx identifies the 1614 Acts of Enclosure in England as a sort of turning point from the transition from feudalism to capitalism in England, but also paradigmatic of capitalist development more broadly and internationally. On the one hand, enclosure robbed the peasantry of a primary means of subsistence and forced them into the position of the dependent laborer, essentially replacing the bondage of serfdom, which had only been officially eliminated in England in 1574 with that of the wage. On the other, by releasing enclosed land into privatized circuits of capitalist accumulation, it provided the emerging work uh, capitalist class with the wealth necessary to purchase this labor and therefore control the means of production. Absent in Marx's account, but later explicated by Marxist feminist scholars, in particular Silvia Federici and Maria Rosa de la Costa, the spatial confinement of women and the devaluation of their labor fundamentally marks both the history and present of capitalism. Through a series of socioeconomic and juridical processes, by the end of the 17th century in Europe, women had effectively been defined as non-workers and the products of their labor as worthless. Intimately related to the circumscription of female sexuality and the mechanism of mechanization of the female body in the service of biological reproduction, the socio-sexual contract was in part compensatory for pro proletarian men, essentially kind of replacing the land and resources lost to enclosure with the appropriative transformation of women in their work into a proxy commons in the service of social reproduction. This not only forced women into a state of economic precarity and dependence, it also radically devalued labor more generally, since wages were not in reality determined by the true cost of the reproduction of the workforce. Furthermore, it served to produce new divisions within the working class, as the interests of proletarian men became in certain and specific instances more aligned with those of capitalist men than proletarian women. New, dis new discourses emerged to naturalize these social relations, defining women and their work as, among other things, wasteful and excessive. According to this social framework, women's work, namely housework, is not work at all. The divorce of social reproduction from other modes of production necessitated the invention of a new spatial environment, namely the capitalist home, as much as industrial production required the factory. The home was redefined as a space removed from work that provided relief from the hardships of the factory for the male worker. Without this appearance, neither this, the expropriation of women's labor nor the system of wage labor itself predicated on this spatio-temporal fiction of a correlation between wage and labor time, kind of epitomized in the, the trope of clocking in, would be operable. Instead, the life of the worker would be exposed as taking place within one continuous workplace. This is not a home. Rather, it's an office in a strip mall in Hollywood that was redecorated to look like one by Studio 20, a global franchise that provides professional studio space for adult webcam sex work, also known as camming. 
Each room in the studio uh, is a set with one half featuring a digital camera, lights, and a computer, while the other is decorated to look like a bedroom. These devices and decor assembled together not only facilitate the work on display, but support a global somatechnical economy composed of bodily fluids, data, and capital. In an essay that I published in The Use of Decorating, as well as on Eflux, I argue that rather than a pornographic media, camming might be better understood as a unique form of sex in its own right, a techno-social orgy where bodies work to pleasure themselves and others by way of prosthetic technologies and financial transactions. Domestic appearances play a central role in this, achieved through a reduced set of signifiers, such as a bed with only a fitted sheet and a framed inspirational poster, making it therefore usable for different workers. In spite of its generic functionality, however, the appearance of a domestic space proves quite valuable, creating a sense of intimacy by giving the work on display an aura of authenticity. Concurrently, the decor contributes to the sexual capital of the worker within a field in which the domestic is associated with the erotic. And this is because of another domestic fiction, namely that the home is widely understood as a sort of mimetic representation of its inhabitant, signified through the selection of decor. Basically, we, we judge others by how they decorate. We think we can understand them, how they decorate, despite the kind of obvious falsity of this. The fact that how one decorates is determined by class, culture, as well as the kind of basic facts like the location of a store and what they have in stock. So in this case, getting a, clamp, a glimpse into the home of a sex worker, even if it's actually just a facsimile of one, facilitates a sense of honesty and intimacy. It's a turn on. Moving forward, um, this is also not a home. It's a simulation of one produced by the U.S. Marine Corps, part of a larger mixed reality training facility at Camp Pendleton in California. Located in a former tomato factory, this facility features a physical reconstruction of a Middle Eastern neighborhood populated with a mix of live actors and computer-generated videos projected on walls, alongside audio broadcasts of the call to prayer and pumped in smells of rotten meat and sewage. Originally intended to approximate an Afghani village as the locus of military conflict shifted, the simulator was redesigned to appear as an Iraqi village and later to simply evoke a generic third world feel, as one Marine official is quoted as saying. Returning to their interior space, we can see that they're decorated with objects such as a Persian rug and a hookah, in short, generic and often incoherent signifiers of a vague Middle Eastern identity. Here, decorative elements are not used to establish identity so much as its absence, alterity, or otherness. Rather than a representation of a subject, the decor produces an atmosphere of prepackaged alterity that acts to obscure individuality rather than to exhibit it. Through this, the simulator is intended to reprogram the soldier's interpretive relationship to certain domestic spaces the idea that the home is an extension of its inhabitant. So they're associated instead with simply stress, combat, and death. This training simulator therefore is both product and producer of the ideology of American imperialist warfare, which refashions territories as sources of resource extraction rather than nation states through invasion and prolonged occupation. Such a mode of warfare necessarily involves a dissolution of the normative boundaries between combatant and civilian, as well as between battlefield and domestic space. And there, there, therefore demands a soldier who through a typically racialized logic perceives not the presence of a subject, but rather their absence, not a person, but a threat, an enemy or collateral damage. In this, the military simulator reveals that the normative representations of the home, these domestic fictions, can be made useful not only in their application, but also in their deliberate refusal. In the <clears throat> previous two examples, we saw how normative representations of the home can be put to use through simulations within seemingly quite disparate contemporary work environments sex work and military training. Now I'd like to touch briefly on the perhaps reverse dynamic, namely how the semantic meaning of the home has been put under pressure by transformations in the broader economy, specifically within the context of the 2007-2008 financial crash. As is now well known, this crisis was precipitated by an accelerated bubble in the American housing market, induced by an unprecedented expansion of access to finance capital, to credit and loans and debt for populations previously excluded from its circulation. This was largely facilitated through so-called subprime loans or housing loans issued to a borrower with a low credit rating who would otherwise be restricted from taking on such debt due to a high risk of defaulting. 
They're also known as predatory loans due to how they're misleadingly marketed and designed to fail and can be construed as a sort of parasitic appropriation of the domestic fiction of the home as shelter or security, which in this case is transformed into a speculative asset or investment. Alongside the deregulation introduced by neoliberal reformers in government, the emergence of subprime loans relied on a rather older financial technology, uh, namely securitization, which is the bundling of loans together in order to facilitate their sale on markets. Securitization first emerged in the 15th century, but its use expanded radically in the late 20th, enabled by the expansion of global communication networks and high-speed algorithmic trading. As unbelievably affordable loans suddenly became available to middle and working class Americans, in particular non-white populations who were previously barred from obtaining a mortgage in the US, the housing market swelled. People began to view their homes as a speculative investment and primary asset, encouraged by a mediatic environment, TV shows, books, magazines, reality shows, that presented housing as if a gold rush. Borrow, flip, rinse, and repeat. Meanwhile, credit as credit was expanded, wages stagnated, and social services were privatized or entirely dismantled. When the housing market collapsed, millions lost their savings and their homes. And this marked a tra general transformation in the cultural meaning of the home from largely a spatial mechanism um, to, to, to kind of afford security to an, an investment or kind of like a, a kind of a, a means to kind of attain a future through uh, through playing with financial markets. But in this, the residue of older domestic fictions did not simply wash away. Uh, to illustrate this, we can look at a case study from an essay published a few years ago in Real Review about a new genre of porn that emerged concurrently with the housing crisis, uh, specifically real estate or property porn. For example, this comes from propertysex.com, a company that claims to put the home in homemade porn and ranks as the eighth most popular channel on the porn aggregate site, Pornhub. Their website features a wide array of heterosexual pornographic videos in which various social relations of contemporary property ownership and their attendant power dynamics are played out. In many, female tenants avoid eviction by having sex with their male landlords. Sometimes female real estate agents are sexualized, while other times it is the potential buyer or tenant. Long before the housing market crash, domestic porn was an expansive genre, genre such as with made fetish uh, videos or even illustrations from the 19th century or incest porn. But the addition of such property porn signals the pornification of the real estate economy itself. Put simply, the home has always been saturated with sex. What the house houses is sexuality and what domesticity domesticates is desire. It not only operates as a mechanism of controlling sexuality, but itself emerges from the control of sexuality. As such, it has long been charged with eroticism and has figured pr prominently in erotica and pornographic representations for centuries. But propertysex.com suggests that today, the commodification of the home and the precarity it induces, which is also to say the primary symptoms of the home um, within contemporary finance capitalism, have themselves become a sort of sexual stimuli. The way the bourgeoisie fucks the proletariat, to quote Deleuze and Guattari, by appropriating their labor as private property and then leasing it back to them in exchange for rent, becomes itself a pay-per-view representation comprising 720 lines of 1,280 pixels that change form 29.97 times a second, producing a barrage of photons that are translated into neuronal signals by the brain, releasing oxytocin into the bloodstream and driving a genital, genital response exploitation transforms into ejaculate and is captured as profit. My final case study returns to war as well, and is also from the United States, specifically housing developments constructed outside of Las Vegas for drone pilots. This research was published in Pinup Magazine, and the illustrations are from that, and it tries to unpack the dynamics behind the high suicide rates among drone pilots. While the U.S. Air Force does not publish statistics specific to drone operators, suicide ranks as the biggest killer of all active duty airmen and surpassed war as the entire military's leading cause of death in 2014. Contrary to common assumptions, these suicides are not necessarily preceded by trauma from battlefield experiences. In fact, 68% of members of the Air Force who have killed themselves were never deployed. In 2013, the New York Times reported that drone pilots were found to have similar rates of psychological distress, including suicidal ideation, as traditional pilots. 
This correlates to findings from a recent report by the RAND Corporation, which discerned that among the leading causes were long work hours, as well as combat compartmentalization, or the disjunct caused by switching between remote combat and civilian life within short periods of time. That is, drone pilots are deployed on station in military language, which means they spend hours working in air-conditioned trailers fighting a war thousands of miles away before returning home to their families. In an August 2017 piece in the New York Times, General James B. Hecker described how days might be spent surveilling a family compound, learning intimately the patterns of their target's behavior, watching them play soccer with their children, celebrate holidays with their friends, sleep with their wives before launching a Hellfire missile that detonates in high definition. Then the drone operators leave to play soccer with their own children, celebrate holidays with their own friends, sleep with their own husbands or wives. According to a 2014 report by the Air Force, pilots in each of 10 focus groups cited this as a major cause of their distress, with some even stating a preference to be deployed in theater. One pilot has been quoted as saying, sometimes it's hard to keep switching on and off, back and forth. It's like living in two places at the same time, parallel universes. It was enough to make a predator pilot schizophrenic. These two parallel universes are, for the majority of drone pilots, about a 40 minute drive apart. Most Air Force drone operators are stationed at Creech, Creech Air Force Base, 35 miles northwest of Las Vegas. They typically live in either Indian Springs, the town directly adjacent to Creech, or in the North Las Vegas suburbs. Some rent or buy private homes, while others live in military funded housing communities, such as the Nellis Family Housing uh, on the nearby Nellis Air Force Base. And, and one thing to say is that uh, later in the essay, kind of a pivotal thing that I look at is how a huge chunk of these uh, Air Force men were affected by the housing crash um, because a lot of them invested during the but, but unlike other people who might be able to kind of wait out the, the, uh, the crash, since they're restationed constantly, they had to sell it at low rates and it caused kind of a massive um, loss of, of, of wealth for these soldiers. Um, the Air Force Base, the Air Force Housing Complex, I was just talking about the Nellis Family Housing, uh, manages over 1,100 homes divided between five distinct communities, all of which feature a blend of, quote, contemporary and traditional Mediterranean and mission style elements. The communities cater to the specificities of military life, such as offering a payment and arrears structure. They also boast pools, a pharmacy, a gun club, a barbershop, a post office, a golf course, and even a hospital. In short, they constitute an ideal of suburban living, both distinct from, distant from the workplace and self-enclosed, specifically attuned to the needs of military personnel. And yet for the Air Force drone pilots, it is precisely the safe remove from combat that causes their distress. Rapidly and repeatedly switching back and forth from war zone to home life, the drone pilot experiences a breakdown in the semantic register of both. Suburbia, a signifier of domesticity, becomes a battlefield and the inoculation of remote warfare proves not only a fiction, but in fact, poisonous. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nicholas. That was, that was great. Um, really great um, case studies um, that, that relate to, to our research. Um, and even if they might seem, I think, uh, for some of us at some point kind of extreme, but they're so useful to understand our um, conditions in general of uh, work and, and life um, in contemporary society in a way. Um, but I think I, um, while people start thinking of uh, the questions, uh, if you have some, um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you about um, this kind of the, the creation of this uh, fiction uh, of this kind of set. Um, and um, going back, for example, to the, to the coming studio, um, cause we're, we're looking at uh, in, in the unit at ways to kind of resist in this, this labor condition and this, um, constant online offline shift or this presentation of the physical spaces, but also ourselves um, online. Um, have you found, or do you think they are, uh, they're, they are in that in-between space, in between those physical and digital worlds uh, in, and in that creation of, of the set, but also on the performance of the, of the person living in, in, in that set or working that set. Uh, if they're, um, 
if there is kind of material for for architects to work with to to rethink uh, practice um, from from this um, kind of in between space. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things I was kind of struck by um, when when COVID hit. Um, was kind of what felt like I, I did this research into into the camming studios, but also the research looks at also people who don't go to camming studios. So people typically go to these camming studios are they're quite expensive and they offer a, a number of perks like um, well, sometimes even credit lines, but also like hair studios and makeup studios. But really, the the kind of primary uh, like a uh, value that they offer is, is, is safety because um, cam sex workers often maybe they have a whole uh, family that, that, that disapproves of their work, doesn't know about their work, and they don't want them to know about it, but also there's a huge risk of doxing, right? So like when people identify your home, they can publish your address online. Um, cam, cam sex is like a kind of, like all sex work, but um, kind of in an intense way, it's also, you know, it's a form of effective labor. A lot of uh, cam sex uh, workers describe it as akin to like therapy. Um, and so they create kind of very loyal, intimate uh, audience relations. Um, and some of these fans can become obsessive. And there's a kind of interesting example where, where one uh, worker was talking about, one, one camera was talking about um, how when faced with an obsessive uh, fan who is uh, threatening doxing, she actually redecorated the background of her home. She was doing it in her own home. Started kind of talking about in her uh, in her performances and in her, in her work, talking about an impending move she was going to do, which was fake. But she said she was going to. Her name is Miss Dahmer. Um, uh, her pseudonym is um, to move to the southwest. And to achieve this, she started putting. There was a window on on her wall, which was visible in the in the in the frame started planting uh, plants that were native to the Southwest, cacti, succulents and stuff, and painted the walls, shifted the furniture to kind of achieve the effect of a move, um, which I thought was quite quite interesting. But kind of more broadly, I think one of the things I struck on but when COVID happened was um, the way in which strategies, which which CAMSEX workers have discussed for, for like years, decades, almost, not, almost a decade, let's say, um, on blogs and forums about how to kind of achieve the set within your own home um, became quite pertinent for everyone, right? Um, there's a kind of fantastic comic that, that circulated for a while ago from like the, from like 2005, I think, that, that shows um, like a really messy room. It's an aerial, like a plan perspective, and it shows this terribly messy room. And then there's um, the, the field of view from the webcam creates a kind of line of cleanliness. So everything's messy except for that. And I think that's something, I mean, that's something we've all kind of learned, had to learn to do in the last year. I mean, right now I'm surrounded by mess <laughs> and I set this up and that's why I was a little late. Um, and, <laughs> or, or you do the screen, screen right? Um, and yeah, I've even saw uh, once on a kind of, uh, the other day I was, I was going through Instagram and I was given a tailored ad for tips to redecorate your room for work meetings. Um, and, and so I think we, you can see, I think with the, with the case of uh, camming, there is this kind of sense of like, they were kind of, let's say, early to the scene of, of what it means to be constantly doing video telephonic work um, within domestic space. Um, and then what's kind of interesting then, if you look at the studios, I think, is to see how um, the value that gets brought in from the domestic space into a completely artificial environment that, you know, a, a, a technically one might think that a, a camera could just work in a blank room, but really also there's value to be had in the signification of domesticity because of these reasons I was talking about, these domestic fictions, this idea that by seeing someone's home, you kind of get to know them better. And I think that becomes also something to be thought about within the kind of, let's say, the, the generalization of video telephonic work, um, where um, like what role does, if any does, do we have to the kind of sense of, let's say, a new porosity to the home? Um, the sense that on the one hand, the kind of fear that we're being invaded. So like what kind of spaces, what kind of design strategies can we come up with to ameliorate that? I think one of them is, for example, Zoom's introduction of, of the screen screen uh, effect, for example. Um, but also um, in what cases can we say, like, can we, let's say, uh, extract value from that visibility? Is there a way to kind of offer ourselves um, but then, of course, you have to question, right, like, do we want to offer ourselves as, as like, the intimacy of ourselves um, to a potential employer? Right, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's also, I was wondering about the, 
um, the drone uh, pilots, this um, idea about kind of like dislocation, how their work is so dislocated from their home, but also from their targets or kind of their work. <laughs> Um, and yeah, this idea that say if we all started kind of using these backgrounds, then they were all um, uh, we were all like dislocated as well. Um, what what that would create? Like we could gain some power, but also there's something that um, these platforms are not kind of like um, um, you know neutral in a way. Uh, so what that could create as well in terms of um, our work and the communication of the of our work. The other thing that um, I was thinking is uh, social media. If you thought about if you um, if social media, you think had an impact on all of this and uh, kind of going back to this uh, of performance. So this idea of kind of externalizing your life to get validation. So you share something on Instagram and if you don't share that you're in a concert, it doesn't exist or you didn't go, or even now at work, uh, maybe you slack at the beginning of work to, to show that you're working on this like idea of externalizing what you, the, the performance um, is, is also part of the, um, maybe it was used more as a strategy in these cases um, or yeah, if there's a use there as well. Right, I mean, I, I think that I particularly I've looked at like YouTube videos rather than things like Instagram. Um, but I guess social, YouTube is also a social media platform. One of the things that an essay that's in, in this book um, looks at YouTube home decorating tutorials. Um, it's like a kind of crazy ecosystem. I, there's also a video I did recently about um, that, like there's videos like um, uh, clean with me videos where people clean their homes and it's a kind of mobilization to uh it's like the reason why other people watch people cleaning their homes is to kind of self-motivate to clean their bedrooms right so you watch a video and you clean at the same time clean with me um and and what's kind of interesting about that in light of what you're just asking is is that on the one hand right it's kind of like our it's like a translation of domestic labor into performance into a sort of kind of mediatic environment um, but it also, of course, it gets layered or multiplied with other forms of, of work and economization, because obviously the goal of these people is to, to generate enough of an audience to then get ad revenue through YouTube. Meanwhile, YouTube's kind of fracking the, the, the knowledge economy of decorating, um, which is already an unremunerated labor um, within this kind of broad history of, 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 of kind of the, the which, I, which I mentioned about, about the invisibility and, and uh, uh, exploitation of or expropriation of women's the value produced by women's work um, then gets kind of expropriated again on another level by the algorithms of YouTube um, and kind of generates the the valuable uh, audience metrics which help uh, uh, kind of amplify its stock alphabet its parents company stocks on, on on markets so I guess my my one of the things that I'm always kind of looking at is how these things get kind of layered together um, rather than kind of a kind of logic of replacement um, or like uh, kind of uh, ep epochal shifts really you kind of see this kind of this like endless multiplication of forms of labor labor forms of expropriation and forms of extraction I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, I guess the, the other thing about the, the, the sense of producing the self, which is kind of integral to all of this, right, um, is the way in which, yeah, the home becomes kind of a, a, a metonymic representation of the person already existing, I think, for a long time. I mean, we always judge people by their homes, but then when you amplify that into the possibility of broadcasting your home um, to potentially infinite number of people, um, yeah, the kind of performative value is amplified, I think. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's uh, open the floor for um, some questions. Um, if anyone has any questions. Um, um, you can raise your hands or uh, post it on the chat. We have a comment. Right, like in this comment, I mean, as it's happening right now, right? So <laughs> I see a list of names. Um, oh, you have a question, yeah. Hi, so uh, in the end, it was mentioned that drone pilots uh, have faced this sort of uh, position where they're supposed to switch between a home life and a state of warfare quite quickly. Um, I was wondering, like, in the case of COVID, it's happened that all the work has been moved inside the home. 
what would sort of happen if like drone pilots were given a space that was like a home as well what would that what would the what would be the effect of that would they i don't know i was just wondering because because they are they have these two physical spaces that they have to alternate between because as you mentioned that they are employed in the area and it's like 40 minute difference but what would happen if like that even that did not exist and they were in the same space during the whole time right i mean i think that's quite terrifying and quite an interesting a question and something worth kind of digging into to see how they've dealt with covid in the in the us air force um something I, I, I can't answer with, with with kind of like solid fact but i think so one of the kind of questions the, the, the essay itself is kind of uh it's kind of a broader inquiry into um into i guess technologies of distanciation um so looking at on the one hand these technologies as they go for, in warfare like Virilio talks about warfare as a kind of series of progressive distanciations you start with an arrow to uh, like a, a like the, the spear or whatever spear to arrow and then you kind of build up to missile and eventually drones right um and these kind of put increasing distance between the kind of um the, the te- in the traditional forms of warfare between the combatant and, and other combatants but i think in, in in the context of american imperial warfare between combatant and victim really um these uh kind of these Technologies of distanciation are meant to be protective, self-protective, right? Um, and I look at how suburbia is also a military technology of distanciation. I mean, it was quite literally um, the U.S. after seeing the the damage they were they'd done to um, in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also in, in Europe, um, they realized, I guess, the kind of the, the when they came back after the war, the kind of uh, precarity of American uh, infrastructure as well. Basically, it's like centralization um, produ- it, like, produces a lot of insecurity for a, a government, um, for, for a state. Um, they During the war, they were always looking at like, how can we take out a linchpin factory and therefore like eliminate the entire Luftwaffe, right? So it's like, if you can take out the ball bearing factory, the whole Luftwaffe goes with it. Um, and so when they came back and they started looking at, 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 at American urban morphology, let's say, um, they started trying to think about defensive strategies to kind of, um, to kind of protect them. And suburbia was one of them. Um, there was kind of this other side of it, um, which the work of like Beatrice Kalamina unpacks to a bit, a bit, which was the idea that this suburbia kind of came or like a remediative technology, um, to to kind of help a, a traumatized PTSD soldier adjust to post-war boom American life, the, sub, the suburban house where you also have again you have this this woman who becomes kind of like quite literally trapped. I mean, in so many depictions of, of 1950s domesticity, uh, you see the kind of like ennui uh, and angst that 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 generated. Um, uh, and the medicalization that induced right with, with, with Prozac and, and barbiturates. Um, you, you have this kind of altered the sense of kind of like constructing a technology, both through the kind of, let's say, the, the expropriation of women's work alongside an architecture and together coming up with a, a really a military technology, which is the suburban home. And it was facilitated by these VA loans, veteran administration loans, which were not given to black soldiers, for example, but were given to white soldiers. And, and that kind of is the American dream, right, of the 1950s. Um, by the time the housing crisis crash had hit, um, the VA loans had really not kept up with market prices in America. And so that's, as I was saying, a lot of these servicemen in these now kind of continuous wars, right, where there's not really a return, started playing into the housing market. Um, I, I, in the essay, I talk about how securitization is also a distanciating uh, technology, in this case, between the, the creditor and the debt, right? So it's like a creditor can afford to give a housing loan to um, a person who would otherwise be like too at risk of default um, because they can bundle them together and trade them on markets. And so it's, so it's, there's less risk involved. The risk is distantiated. But all these technologies of distanciation meant to protect people all ultimately end up kind of doing what I call a kind of autoimmunitary logic, borrowing from the work of Derrida, um, like a kind of an autoimmunitary process of the body um, where your cells start attacking, healthy cells start attacking themselves 
um, thinking that they're antigens, thinking that they're 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 non um, they're not endemic to the body. Um, and so there's a similar, I think, logic at play in all of this. Um, kind of returning to your question though about this, what's kind of interesting is, is that the the distanciation is also a collapse. Um, uh, all of a sudden, you have um, Afghanistan or Pakistan. Um, on your screen in HD connected by satellite banks. Um, and so it's it's kind of a strange thing where you have, you can detonate a bomb without even entering into a plane, um, but you're all the way around the world. Distance and collapse become almost meaningless or distance, proximity and distance become almost meaningless in this. And so I, I think it's quite an interesting question to ask what happens if war work, the work of war becomes also brought into the home. Um, Although I think there's also a question for the, I'm sure you guys will be tackling in the studio of like, are we, is this the new normal as it's been phrased or is this, um, or are we already reacting to it? You know, um, and, and I don't know. I think in the way we are reacting is quite interesting in itself because as a student who's attended a lot of uh, lectures online during my first year, I feel like, you know, we're s- as students, we're still trying to protect our personal space because we can't go up. We have no place to go, but we're still trying to protect that by just turning the video off. Even though we are in this space that is digitally there, we refuse to, or sort of have a reluctance to put our physical spaces on broadcast as well. Uh, But it's sort of created this, even though we are together in this digital space, there's still this disconnect because we are not together. We are actually not together. We can't see each other in a way that we can't understand what the crowd is thinking because we have no way to look at their facial expressions, the way they are talking. Or it's sort of also not even encouraging inter-conversations because supposedly if this talk was happening in a big hall with a lot of people, there would be, I would be talking to people around me, discussing ideas, even between while you were speaking, while that would be a little disrespectful, that would be the ideal thing we would do because that's the point of this whole thing, to start a conversation, to have some ideas that are bounced around. So it's quite interesting, but like, I don't really like it to be fair. (laughs) Me neither. Um, I also, I think that, that there's, um, I think it, it, it's an interesting question about, you know, how do we react? I mean, on the one hand, there's a kind of sense, of course, like it's, I, I teach at Design Academy in Eindhoven and the last year has been miserable for my students there as well. And for me, um, doing workshops online um, of, of like, you know, there's some point you are, there's a sense, at least with this co- with COVID of a sense of like, okay, well, who am I to blame? Like a virus, right? You know, like at a certain level, we can't, there's, there's just truly the epidemiological risk. Um, on the other hand, of course, you can very easily say that uh, this governments, particularly in Western Europe and the UK, uh, the US have been kind of terrible. Um, but I think if we also look at kind of a dynamic broader than, than COVID, um, and see how these dynamics were happening beforehand, and how likely a lot of a lot of kind of employers, corporations, and companies will leverage this. I mean, you see it happening already. It, 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 to realize they don't have to rent office space is going to, you know, it's like okay, that saves a lot of money. For the one hand, it's going to mean this be a glut of empty office spaces in all these cities, like half of London, right? Um, but then also, um, there's going to probably put increasing pressure on the housing market, which is already under pressure in most cities, um, as people want better houses. You already see people moving to the countryside, but like, I don't think that's going to be a, a durational trend because we need cities. Um, and so you have these kind of open questions of how this is going to all work. And in terms of, do we resist it? You know, if, if we kind of, I think most people agree that this sucks, right. Then like, do we, how do we kind of resist or refuse? I mean, one of the things that I was hoping to talk about, but I had to limit for the sake of time, um, was, I guess, kind of strategies of pushing against this, right? Like, uh, and looking in particular at uh, kind of two uh, kind of, well, actually really emerged almost concurrently, both in Italy, um, two, two kind of uh, ways of kind of mapping and understanding, let's say, the, the proliferation of work into all of life and two modes of rejecting it. So on the one hand, you have the work of the uh, uh, Operismos or autonomistos, the autonomous movement in Italy. Um, so like Antonio Negri, uh, Mario Tronti, um, the, these people. And a lot of that research I did with my collaborator, Joanna, on refusal. Um, and they, they speak about basically the, the kind of 
on the one hand, their their description of reality, and this is in, in the 1960s in Italy, is that the factory has extended beyond its boundaries, that all of life, what they call the social factory, is now um, kind of increasingly and progressively as capital um, develops, um, you see kind of increasing encroachment on every part of life to the point where all of life is consumed within this. On the other hand, also happening in Italy a little bit later, but really kind of contemporaries, you have people like Silvia Federici and Maria Rosa de la Costa, Marxist feminists, who, um, who talk about, uh, th they kind of come to the conclusion that I, I sketched out that in fact, since the beginning of wage labor, all of life has been part of the factory. It's simply that through the kind of invisibility and denigration of women's work of women's bodies that you see the, you kind of, that you, that, that we can kind of fictionalize and imagine that the factory ends, the factory day ends, but really already you have the kind of total incorporation of everything we do within to the circuits of production. Um, and so for Tronchi and the autonomists, the response to the social factory was refused to, to opt out, um, to quit, to be lazy, um, which I think is still a kind of very interesting argument. Um, a kind of different strategy offered by the Italian uh, uh, Marxist feminists of the era um, was known as, they created a group called Wages for Housework. And their argument, which I think is actually, was also quite, quite interesting and quite provocative is that is to demand wages for housework. And, and what they're doing in a sense is they're, since they're Marxists and are kind of like calling for the expansion of wage labor, but really for its collapse, because as I kind of mentioned, there's simply not enough money in the world, circulating in the world to pay wages for housework. And so if you make the demand that it must be recognized as work, first of all, you have the recognition that all of life is, is work, that all of life is kind of in service of the production of capital. And on the other hand, you make an impossible demand that kind of fractures society altogether. And perhaps I should have included this at the beginning, because one thing I, I was kind of thinking about in this two-part structure of, of the talk is on the one hand, the idea of, let's say, reclaiming the, the use of the domestic and putting it to work in clever ways, like you can see with, with, with camp sex workers, or in kind of like diabolical ways with the US military training simulators. Um, the, to see that these are elements to be played with, designed, um, or on the other hand, to look at also the kind of destabilizing function they already have, that the kind of systems are already breaking and what kind of things can you throw into the machine that could perhaps activate them to, to, to activate a certain kind of collapse and a kind of wages for housework style um, strategy. That's great. Yeah, I think um, this is definitely something that we're um, going to be looking at, these kind of resistance strategies. Um, and yeah, definitely one part is either there's also the Luddites coming back with the breaking the machines uh, or yeah, demanding for more. Because also there's this thing about how little we have demanded. Uh, we were through we were thrown into Zoom instantly. And I don't think most, I didn't do it, certainly, but not um, everyone had a privilege or, or also uh, thought about demanding for from a company or for a university, okay, if you want me to work in this situation, you need to provide all of this uh, set, um, literally this set, uh, mm -hmm. to separate still my private life from uh, from the kind of communication of my life by making me work from home. So, yeah, there's definitely um, a lot to, to kind of, um, learn from there. So we have a question from um, Jean, if you want to mute yourself. Uh, hello. Um, I was just um, thinking as you sort of presented that there were some parallels with um, sort of feminist strategies in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I thought I'd sort of just unpack these if you don't mind. I mean, I'm thinking of... Um, a paper that was very important to feminists from that generation, which I'm one of them, uh, was Freud's uh, was paper to, uh, uh, to psychoanalysts about what do women want. And Freud says, you know, the women in the room, you can't answer this question because you're too close to the body. You are appearance and body. So this question about what you want really has to go to the subjects in the room because you're just an object in the field of vision. And this was sort of taken up by feminists and sort of repeated. So women weren't able to use their own image. And then the struggle was to think, how can 
I show that I'm a subject who can play with the accoutrements of femininity and hyperbolize these accoutrements and absolutely mix up because the other paper that was very important at the time was Freud's three essays on sexuality in which he, he, he basically shows that the set of all civilized men have a symptom, which is the division of women into virgins and whores. And women through hysteria and the masquerade would have to sort of take up a position in relation to this the men's symptom. And I just thought that a possible strategy would be to show subjectivity by hyperbolizing the accoutrements that are already there in decoration, as you're saying, that are, you know, historically and uh, economically and politically um, determined, but that are not understood to be such. And to actually show, um, to hyperbolize and to play with and to show subjectivity you get what I'm saying, and to absolutely mix those codes up so that they actually hollow out in the way that feminists of a certain generation did. You just try and think you can read me in relation to my red lipstick or what I'm wearing. You know, they would mix up virgin and whore and they would hyperbolize it and show that they're not objects in the field of vision for the masculine gaze. They're actually subjects playing with these codes, rhetorics and signs and these accoutrements, and they're playing with them as subjects, and that they, and they at the same time hollowing them out for anyone who encountered them. And I was wondering, I think you're already doing that. You're actually, you know, I think what you're performing or say, suggesting is already being performed. Is that already in some way? I think that's a, a brilliant comment. Um, a lot of, I think, my, my work revolves around kind of what I see as a, like the tyranny of, of, the, of the kind of uh, demand for a stable subject right now, um, and a kind of increasing demand. Um, and you see this, I think, uh, to, back to what Federico was saying about social media on the one hand, too. And I, I, if there is a kind of form of, 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 let's say, resistance possible, I mean, and I think it depends on the day about whether or not I think there is, because we do see, on the other hand, the kind of recuperation and incorporation of even emotional vulnerability, even like every, like every strategy it seems uh, intended to kind of fracture these things gets incorporated within circuits of capital once again. Um, but I do think that if there is something it is to kind of make kind of politics of incoherence um, and a kind of a, a way of rejecting and refusing the ability, the ability to be mimetically read based off of other objects that you have very little control over what they are and, and such. Um, but so there's this, that one side, which I guess one could say like a kind of radical position or perspective um, towards it. Um, and then there's also, of course, I, I, I kind of go back and forth with also the fact that um, maybe like a kind of reformist attitude, the fact that people are just trying to get by. Um, and so I think that in the case of decorating a lot of it, one of the things that I, I look at is because I believe in the work is kind of grounded in the belief that or the understanding of decorating as labor, um, that when you look at things like trends um, or YouTube tutorials or this kind of long, long literature uh, uh, going back to at least the 19th century of, of, of manuals for how to decorate but also, of course, of the transmitted knowledge that happens from mother to daughter or between women um, about how to decorate. These things are a kind of, let's say, a, 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 an almost like a proto-automation technology designed to reduce labor. Because uh, decorating a home is, is a kind of spatial prompt. Is theoretically a kind of, you have an infinite array of possibilities laid out in front of you. And since you also have to probably work or raise children or clean, you know, to limit those, reduce those is, is, is useful. And then of course you also need, the home needs to function a certain way. It's not simply, it's never been a private space, but particularly now with these peoples everywhere, these digital peoples. Um, but also, I mean, you look at in the, in, in the US, for example, um, home appraisers going into the home of, of, of black families, there's actually a kind of whole uh, ecosystem online of people, of, um, people talking about how they should remove signifiers of their black identity and how that helps to get a higher appraisal if your home is facing foreclosure or if you're trying to just sell it. Um, and so it, it, there's a kind of going back and forth, right, between is it like, is it about survival mechanisms or is it about complete kind of refusal, rejection and radical, like yeah, a radical rejection of the kind of, let's say, tyranny of identity and its visualization through objects. Um, yeah, I think 
um, just on that, I think on uh, this reflection on, on the now, um, on the circumstances also, there's a whole discussion around or kind of a positive side that probably could come out of this moment is uh, bringing about discussions around universal basic income and, and demanding for more or the um, an importance of unions to, to really come back. So it's like a political decision behind this uh, at the end and how to uh, re-engage with, with that um, to, yeah, to change things. Um, we have a question, um, Khaled. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm unmuted. Uh, yeah. I mean, th thank you very much. That was a very, very interesting uh, talk in general. I mean, I have a build up on the, on the previous question, which uh, I mean, maybe in, in a different way, but I, I just wonder if, if there are as well kind of possibilities in other kind of ontological understandings of the home. So, so you know, you, you have, you, I mean, you, ha you have notions of, I don't know, poetic dwellings, you have notions of kind of, you know, is, is there a possibility of the home outside of the conception of labor? And then can that actually become a means by which we, we you know, we, we, we grapple with those concepts. I mean, you, you, the, the transmission of knowledge was a very, very interesting point, I think, uh, you know, as, as a site of memory, as a site. And I just wonder if, you know, maybe, maybe it's the same as asking, actually, is there, is there, is there possibility for existence outside of politics? But I, I actually, it's, there is, I think that that idea of political incoherence, I think, ties into, you know, as well, the, the examples you brought up were kind of all extractive examples. So the idea that the home is always defined from the outside, rather, I think, from the internal, uh, you know, towards the outside. And I, I wonder if, if there are any kind of references or cases or possibilities that actually you've come across uh, in, in regards to this. Right, I mean, so a lot of the kind of the projects that I was talking about today um, are, are kind of invested in a, in a, in a, in a, in a project of, 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 of denaturalizing the home. Because I think one of the kind of issues is the way in which it's so naturalized that we, we take as common sense, we take as natural, the way in which the home appears and the way the home functions, even as it's put into very different um, kind of circulations uh, of, of, of value, um, but also um, as, as a kind of like, like as a shelter, right? As, as places we live. On the other hand, of course, the home is also more, much more than that. I mean, uh, even now, even living in this financialized, in, in a financialized home, let's say it's always more than that. It's always, mm, it's always also, there's always also different homes than that, right? You know, not everyone is living in a home that they purchased through debt. Um, or and, and kind of put under that pressure. There's of course people who are members of the inheritance class, but then there's also people who are just still do not have access to to, to loans and debt. Um, and then of course there's also the sense that like and, and it's something that I, I you know I feel very much that the home is also not just you know like this kind of like extractive machine. The home is also the home, right? It's, it's like the family, you, like this, a similar kind of thing, right? Like yeah, on the one hand, and I'm very sympathetic to uh, kind of critiques of the home as a kind of reproductive machine for a labor force, um, or even antinatalist critiques of, of the family. Um, but then, of course, people want families and people want to have fam uh, homes, and, and 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 to kind of mix that the way in which let's say to not let the extractive mechanisms of capital completely um, destroy everything we have. I mean, if it already is entered into the home and work is already entered into the home, to not let it take every aspect of, it, of its kind of sanctity um, and beauty or even, um, I think is an, is an important kind of thing to be made. There's also, of course, going to what you're saying. I mean, the home has existed in very many different ways um, historically within dis prior to wage labor not necessarily in, in better ways, not necessarily in ways I think that we should return to, um, but in different ways. Um, and I think that that is something to be looking at. I mean, something I, I, I've been looking at is intentional communities among like monastic orders um, from like, like the fourth to 12th century, which are also like not necessarily good places, but provide alternative kind of structures for how we can understand domestic. So I don't not necessarily saying anything would be a good or bad. And even with the examples I'm showing, some of them are very violent, but with something like the camp studios, I think we could also see that there's kind of quite a, quite a kind of uh, inventive design strategies at play or ways of relating to, um, let's say, um, systems and, and circuits of, of, of capital and extraction. Um, 
yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Um. The other thing I'll go to you keep in a second, but I just wanted to add maybe on that, I think it's really interesting on this idea of other notions of housing and probably, um, or um, that's what I was gonna talk about, but basically um, I think we're in our minds now where we have the single family house, the individual house. And also maybe it might be that um, because of this idea of not wanting to show in our backgrounds, not wanting to show our privacy, we're also not, I'm not wanting to, I don't want to show my flatmates. So there's no space for a collective in this Zoom space. So I think also that maybe has uh, um, forced us to only imagine house as the single family house. And I think it'd be interesting to think this discussion within the, the discussion around a collective housing on, or understanding um, even from the labor perspective and domestic labor perspective, uh, a cooperative housing and what working on Zoom would mean if we imagine a cooperative um, domestic environment as well. So I think that will bring the discussion into other places and maybe there's something there to, to think in terms of uh, strategies for resistance as well. Um, Keep. I don't know if you had a question or. Yeah. Um, there. Yeah. During your presentation, I'm not sure if, if I understood uh, if I followed correctly, but you were showing uh, the home of uh, homes in England in the past, and um, the artisans, the merchants were using the homes as as workplaces. Um, and I think you were saying that our modern concept of home is is that this private space is actually something very recent. And in fact, the home was more of an open place. Um, and Federico, you were saying your, your flatmate is there. I, I would imagine that in the, uh, the, the relatively modest homes of old England, that the family would be around that when visitors came for for giving orders for for some sort of manufacture or for, for purchasing things that you would not just have the visual uh, intrusion but the energetic intrusion of the physical presence of the people so are we with with zoom uh, etc are we starting to go back to something that is more normal or do you think that we the move away from that was a uh, was a correct thing to have happened and we shouldn't go back to that right it's an interesting question i i, I have trouble like s making evaluative judgments and in part because you know without ever being able to be in those homes you also you were not only cohabitating with you know a lot of family members and labor and yeah, I think as, you, as you're probably correct in saying, um, intrusions from the village. But also, of course, these were most serfs in medieval England. These actually, the paintings were mostly Flemish because it's really only the, the Flemish school that really shows um, non, like the homes of working classes. Um, it's kind of one of the only archival materials we can have about how they decorated, how they constructed their spaces. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they're probably pretty approximate to, to what we would have seen in, in England at the time. Um, you also, of course, were also cohabitating with like animals and like livestock. And I mean, it, they were not sanitary conditions. You didn't own them. You were you were rent leasing them from from a lord, and um, you also had to, in exchange for that, work on their fields. In some ways, I think there was, you know, so like the project of Silvio Federici, I think, can be who talks about this kind of the move into wage labor, the confinement of women into the homes, the, the kind of the 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 enclosure of their of women within the homes alongside the enclosure of of commons. Um, you one could probably critique as somewhat like let's say nostalgic and arguing for a certain return. And in many ways she does say that she looks though at also places outside of Western Europe, outside of the West, to make these arguments, um, to look at forms of collectivity and commons that um, exist in, let's say, indigenous communities. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I could say that like there's a normal to return to it that should be returned to, or that there's a normal to pose now and like a new normal, I, you know, I, there are people there, I have kind of in the last year, I feel like there's been these arguments of kind of a circle, right? Like we're kind of going back to this merged space, but I think as I, as I was trying to kind of indicate, I think the idea that they ever separated is also is a fiction. 
the idea that there was ever a time where work was really removed. It's just simply men's work that was removed. Um, and, and, and also some men's work, you know, like a lot of people still worked in the home in the industrial revolution in, in London or Manchester or something. It's a certain kind of understanding of the home that's become a kind of normative fiction that still guides what we think. I mean, it's like when I, when we all think about the home platonically in our head, we probably imagine like a, you know, and, and like, I've never really lived in one of those, you know, I, I live in apartments with, with, with roommates and such, you know? And so I think that there's like this. Um, the sense about one of the things I always kind of wrestle with is, is how does normative representations of the home operate as ideals and yet still structure reality, but without kind of, let's say, aggrandizing them in my analysis of them and, and, and to give enough appropriate um, granular distinction to like the realities. Um, but I do think, I guess, that one of the ambitions of this talk was to kind of show that these normative representations, these normative understandings and assumptions and expectations of the home and what it does do have material implications. Great, thanks so much. Um, so if there are no further questions or do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, well, um, thank you so much, Nicholas. That was a great conversation, great presentation. And thank you everyone for uh, joining today. And um, yeah, we'll speak soon. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and thanks for the great questions. Um, Looking forward to seeing what the studio does.